Good afternoon and welcome to Inside Story, a weekly magazine program produced by the Agency for Public Information. Inside Story highlights government's plans, projects and policies at work in your community. I am Keisha Woodley. Stay with us, an interesting program awaits you this evening. Hi, my name is Chantal Rouse. I'm a past student from the Bethel High School. I currently hold a 200, 400 and 800 meter senior girls record. On achieving these records, I was very confident about myself. I always have respect for myself and others and I was always dedicated to the school. If you had a chance to interview Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonsalves, what would you ask him? The API's Dion John sat down a few weeks ago for an exclusive interview with Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves at his private home in Goss. Part one of this two-part interview focuses on the strategies and development policies and agenda of the government for the next two years. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzales spends his weekends one season in St. Vincent at his private home in Goss. He was there to meet and welcome my team and I as we arrived. The scenery was breathtaking, pausing to admire the many books which adorn his beautiful home before I sat down to conduct his first television interview at Goss. Mr. Gonzalez, it's so kind of you to welcome us into your home this afternoon at, at Goss. It's a very beautiful home and we thank you for having us here. Well, it's the, it's the first television interview at Goss, so I'm, I'm very happy that you're christening it okay. in that respect. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, to begin with, um, we want to discuss a bit about the economic strategy, your economic strategy going forward given the global economic situation, which shows no sign of letting up soon? I think we have to begin, if we have to understand clearly the elaboration of our economic strategy, both the factual matrices in relation to our economy and also I have as a backdrop and as a context a number of theoretical approaches which have been advanced by a number of noted Caribbean scholars as to how do we address the question of economic development in small island and in this case small multi-island developing country. In 1952 or thereabouts, Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Prize winner, wrote a very interesting monograph called Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor. He had advanced the thesis a little earlier in a paper in the 1940s when he was professor of economics at Manchester University which incidentally I am um, subsequently attended in the same faculty in which Sir Arthur um, taught and his idea was a very simple one that these countries have unlimited supplies of labor labor albeit which was not highly trained as yet so he was advocating training but at the same time to bring the capital which was scarce match the capital with this these unlimited supplies of labor and have a set of tax concessions for capital and to help to develop a manufacturing base while you are linking that manufacturing base in some way to the agricultural sector but 
developing the agricultural sector too, um, with its linkages with tourism, and also obviously for 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 export. And there was the Puerto Rican model, which came around at the same time. It it was called Operation Bootstrap, and and Sir Arthur's model was caricatured as industrialization by invitation, but that was the, the journalistic snapshot. It was a much more profound thesis and very well worked out, which he subsequently developed in, in, in um, several books, which earned him subsequently the Nobel Prize in 1990, um, just before, in the 1980s. Other writers, the, and I want to just focus on those which bring certain subjects to the table which are, of, which are of relevance. Then there's William Dimas, who did a series of very interesting lectures at McGill University many years ago. And they were subsequently put in a book. In fact, when I did economics, in my first and second year at the University of the West Indies. Dimas's volume, in addition to Arthur Lewis's work, were, were standard fare, plus other persons, naturally. And he highlighted small size as both an in, important, both as a constraint, but also the possibilities attendant upon small size and how that figures, how that features in economic development and building within the framework of Sir Arthur, but putting the question of size as a critical constant. Clearly, if you, if you have a population of 110,000 people as we do have, and you want to sell goods and services, you just can't sell it for the 110,000 persons because the competitiveness would be problematic. You have to have a wider market. So you have to sell your goods and services to people overseas, or you have to bring people here to sell your goods and services. To do that involves a high, highly sophisticated network of, of airports and seaports, which are very efficient. Again, you have to address the question of education and very much so matching labor and capital and seeking the markets overseas. Always against a backdrop of monetary and fiscal stability. Then along came the bundle of New World writers, as they were called, Lloyd Bess. George Beckford, Norman Govan, Clive Thomas, Havelock Brewster. They emphasized two sets of issues. The question of economic integration. And Brewster and Thomas had a book, a very influential book, called The Dynamics of economic integration for the Caribbean, for the West Indies. And the question of how do you manage the external relations between what was called the hinterland, us, and the metropole, Europe, Britain, the United States. How do you manage the exchange relations and the question as to whether or not the state should not play a more important role in economic development to assist in managing more efficaciously these exchange relations. Some were talking for a far greater role of the state than others, but the, 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 the institution of the state became very central in that discussion of exchange relations. So obviously, 
in dealing with bauxite, in dealing with sugar, in dealing with bananas, should we not be getting more rather than just the primary export in the case of bananas or in the case of bauxite? Why, why, why shouldn't we go to the stage of aluminium? Why stay at bauxite or just alumina? In the case of sugar, why do we not look at more end uses of sugar for greater value added to alter the nature of the relations between the metropole and the hinterland? Case of bananas, why don't we control the transportation, the geese ships? Same thing with our route. If we apply those ideas to our own, our own context. And then a body of writings emerged in the, during the same New World period and after. Why don't we look not only at exchange relations, but the relations of production internally. How much is the, 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 the quote-unquote entrepreneur, you called in those days the capitalist, how much do they get and in relation to the, to the worker? What are the kinds of, in addition to the exchange relations between metropole and hinterland, what about relationships between investor and worker? After Reagan and Thatcher became dominant, President Reagan in the US and Margaret Thatcher in the United States, a lot of those notions about the role of the state relationship between metropole and hinterland, internal relations between what is the nature of the, 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 the relationship, the production relations between employer and employee, capitalist and worker. In, the, in Britain and the United States, they say, listen, what is important here is a complete system of free enterprise. Let us, um, and, and insofar as investment overseas, let it be open sesame. And that became part of what was called the Washington Consensus. And in the 1980s, into the 90s, the Washington Consensus, Open Sesame with investment, um, devaluation of currencies to, to facilitate export, um, no restraint on the export of capital um, from your own country, um, poverty and and issues of unemployment were not high on the totem pole. Just a laissez-faire, free enterprise doctrine which evolved into what is called neoliberalism. Well, the Thatcher-Reagan model, applying in our own context with amendments, didn't work. Hardships were, were, um, were encountered. And in the rural area, we had difficulties because part of the Washington Consensus, and as ne which gave rise also to neoliberalism, was that, or which manifested neoliberalism, was that we should have free trade. Not fair trade, but free, free trade. And then the rise of the WTO, the removal of the preferences on our bananas, and all that. So I give you a backdrop of the way some of what I'm talking about because from, from 1950s, they become familiar issues. I'm giving snapshots because you can write a whole thesis on what I'm talking about. So in coming to economic development, that whole framework of the, the history of economic thought in the field of economic development must be in your head. 
as to what is applicable to your factual circumstances of small size, limited resources, uh, um, capital resources. We have problems with our infrastructure, our educational system at the time not being of the best. We don't have an international airport. Our port requires modernization. Energy is very expensive and most of it is imported. So there are critical structural bottlenecks of size, manpower issues, infrastructural problems, and issues such as energy, and of course, the matter of we being in a hurricane zone, and particularly our country being hillside and so on, subject to floods and so forth, and, and subsequently the issue of climate change came forcefully on the agenda. So, what do you do? First of all, you say that the, the broad approach which we would use, and it's important for me to give you that because many things have been tried over the period, you know, and we have a lesson to learn from our economic history in addition to the application of the ideas of economic thought. You say, look, what we need is a harmonious working relationship between the state, the private sector, and the cooperative sector, tripartite sector in the economy. The state, the, the state will play a facilitating role, but the state must not be opposed to necessary and desirable interventions in terms of ownership or even control of certain resources. And, but the private sector, obviously, is the one which controls most of the productive resources. But you have to provide regulation and facilitation through incentives and so on, and to work through the cooperative sector. Where the state would become involved, we import sugar alone. And we use the cross-subsidization the, the cross from sugar to help with to subsidize the, the fertilizer for the farmers. If we didn't import the sugar alone through the input warehouse company, an individual supermarket owner, in all probability, would have imported the sugar from Guyana. Because you can't have too many um, competitors coming in in the, in, in the importation of sugar. There'd be problems with the supply. Then, the first point, therefore, is this tri tripartite economy, the framework. Secondly, the, the economy has to be modernized. It has to be many-sided in the sense that agriculture, industry, tourism, um, financial services, construction, and the like. So it's a modern, which means you have to have the technology, in the all case information technology infused into the system of production. You have um, the, 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 the use of technology, not only in that respect, but modern forms of labor organization in enterprises to get greater productivity. It has to be competitive because you have to sell your goods and services at competitive prices here and for persons from overseas, whether you bring them here or you send the goods and services overseas. So you have a modern, competitive, many-sided economy which is at once local national, regional, and global. Local in the sense that you have to connect it to, the, to where you are and to the nation. Regional, OECS, CARICOM, and CSME. And international because the world is globalized. And then you devise 
a program under those broad rubrics. And the program is designed strategically to correct the bottlenecks. Education is a critical one. Thus, we proceeded with the education revolution. Renewable energy and energy efficiency, which is what we are doing. Fixing up properly the systems for hydro. We're doing solar and we're into geothermal. The bottleneck of the airport. That's why we build the Canoan International, the Canoan Jet Airport, and we are building the Argyle International Airport. And that is why we have improve the functioning of the ports in Kingston and at Camden Park. And we have a program now for the modernization of those ports. As you know, we're doing the study through the CDB and that, that is something for the, the new, the, the, the new um, term, the, the fourth term. Look, and whilst those are being done, you have to address poverty. And therefore, you have to have good social protection. You have to deal with housing. Because you can't modernize the economy without modernizing the whole housing apparatuses. You have to make the country connected with roads. That's why we spend so much time on the main highways to get them in good order, do the Rabuka Bridge, correct a lot of the other bridges. And we have to do all the work related to disaster preparedness to make ourselves more resilient. And then in the management of the economy at the center, we go for prudence and enterprise. Prudent in the sense that we manage our public debt properly. In a man we, we have it in a manageable way. We prioritize our public expenditure. We cut out waste. We cut out corruption. We are enterprising in that we don't say that austerity is the road you go. Because austerity is a wrong and dangerous idea, universally and but very much so in our own context. But the extent of how much you do enterprising work using your fiscal policy will depend on how much fiscal space you have. What kind of a resources do you get in terms of um, grants, soft loans, and your foreign policy comes in there? And how do you attract direct foreign investment to assist you with the capital shortage you have to develop in the main multi-sectoral economy of agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, uh, banking and financial services and other services and, and the like. And to do all that within a framework of good governance, including um, security, proper security, citizen security, national security, and to make sure you have a responsive government and a responsible government. You have a good legal system. Well, we do that regionally. And we do several things regionally, which can better be done regionally than nationally. And do the things which we can do nationally better. So you began by asking me about what is the economic development approach that we use. I give you a brief synopsis of the broad ideational backdrop, economic theories which have been fashioned and, and examples which have been pursued in the region in relation to all of these, which have had a measure of success to one level or another. But you always have to fine tune them and make them applicable to your own circumstances in which you are. But he who knows economics knows no economics. So you, that is why I take you outside of narrow field of economic simplicity to talk about the political economy because I raised the issue of the state, good governance and the whole 
bundle of issues connected thereto with governmental activity. Because without them, you're not going to be able to facilitate economic development. Of course, there are some people who may say, um, some of those social things you talk about, Ralph, by you bringing them in. Um, well, you only have to have a moment's reflection to see the direct connection. Because you had a, a splendid example of just a free enterprise system, and that is the emphasis on which you, you had in Chile under the dictator Pinochet. It came to grief. And people certainly would want, not want to live in those circumstances or where one small set, a handful of people making money and the rest of the people catching hell. So this is why I talk about the relations, in, in the, 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 the production relations internal in the, in, the, in the production process and in the economy. And then I bring you to what is the fiscal situation at the fiscal center of the government. How do you manage that as austerity as against prudence and enterprise? I give the total synopsis and then come to specific programmatic matters where you have to break the, the existing bottlenecks. And in some cases, in terms of an approach, while incremental steps may be useful, and indeed nothing is wrong with incremental steps, but there are certain things which you have to do to develop. You have a chasm, that's the parallel, C-H-A-S-M. You can't cross a chasm, which is a, a, a gorge. You can't cross that by baby steps. If you do so, you'll fall in the bottom of the widening gorge. So you have to take leaps. And all of that we do under the suzerainty of Almighty God. A simple question which you pose with multiplicity of dimensions by way of introducing the subject. Well, Prime Minister, your response was all encompassing because you answered as well uh, my next question, which would have been uh, the strategies are to be employed by small island states to cushion these sort of effects. But in light of all of this, um, with, with all the ongoing challenges, even though you have found ways and means to cushion the effects, uh, how, how do you, is this the most difficult uh, time in, in your period as, as, as Prime Minister of, of this country with all that's happening globally? Well, special challenges have arisen from 2008 and continuing. Um, when we came to office, the issues of small size, the limitations which we spoke about, at the same time, possibilities. But in 2008, late 2008, when the economy, the bottom of the economy dropped out globally, it had the knock-on effect and is still continuing. One difference, of course, is that today we see the price of oil falling. But we mustn't forget that in June, July 2008, it was $147.50 US per barrel of oil. Today, it's hovering around 60 or just below 60. Of course, in 2000, it was 20-something dollars US a barrel. So even though it's, it's much lower now than it was in the middle of 2008, we, have, um, we still have a high price to pay for it. And then there are all the disasters, economic disasters, I mean the natural disasters, which cause economic and social dislocation bringing about disasters of an economic and social nature. And then, after 2000, for all practical purposes, the, the market conditions for bananas changed completely in, in Europe. 
the preferences came to an end. The preferences started to slow down, have a diminution of them since July the 1st, 1993. And in stages, they went, the preferences were cut off bit by bit. And correspondingly, um, bringing, cutting off the, 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 the legs, so to speak, of the banana industry. As we see many, many people leave the industry. Between 1991 and 2001, 37% of the, the, the labor force left agriculture. 37% more than one third. And since 2001, we have stabilized it at that number. Similarly, when you looked at an earlier period, and this is why it's so important to understand the structural constraints that we have there in the, in the, in the economy. Between 1980 to 1990, 1990 to 1991, and 91 to 2001, 2001 to 2012, the unemployment situation remained basically the same, though in the period um, 2001 to 2012, I'm using the census data, even up to the present time, we see that we employed over 6,000 people, more than in 2001. And if you take the number up to 2008, it would have been a number close to, in the region of 8,000 or more. <coughs> Still, you have a, an intractable unemployment problem, and it has to do with the fact that people have been making incremental changes, I mean, the, the, in the economy, but not addressing the structural issues and the bottlenecks which I'm talking about. So even when we employed more people within the period 2001 and 2014, we have more than 6,000 people working. And you have the average insurable wage at the NIS moving by 88% over that period, which is a, a, a fantastic jump from the average being below 10,000 per person in the NIS per annum in terms of the wages and salaries, to almost $18,000 in the year 2013-2014. Uh, so there, there, there are these improvements, but still you have a number of people, significant number of people who are unemployed. So the absorptive capacity of the economy is a serious question which has to be addressed and can only be addressed properly if you break the bottlenecks which I'm talking about. And breaking those bottlenecks take some time. The education revolution, for instance, you're beginning to see effects of the education revolution. But investment in education is a longer term. Unfortunately, before I arrived, there was not the degree of investment in education. Before the ULP arrived to office, the investment in education was not very significant. Or at least, not to the extent as you see it. And what we see it is, at the moment is revolutionary, since 2001. Um, similarly, how are you going to bring more tourists to the country if you don't have an international airport? How are you going to enhance competitiveness if you're, the price of energy hovers around 40 US cents per kilowatt hour per unit when other 
places are having it. I'm not talking, and that's the same problem which applies to, to all our countries in the Caribbean. Barbados may be a little less than us because of the, 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 the fact that they have transmission costs are uh, less than ours. They're, they're, they're a country who are just, they're 150 square miles, we are 133. But we are very mountainous and we are spread out. Barbados is very concentrated and they have 270,000 people. So those, their unit costs are less for, for those various reasons, to some extent to St. Lucia. Um, but countries, Grenada, Dominica, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you can't have energy at 40 US cents a kilowatt hour or there or thereabouts. It may come down a little now that we see the price of fuel coming down. But you need, you need a proper solution to that. And the solution lies in delivering the 20% of hydro, 20% of our electricity supply by hydro more efficiently. By having solar, we are on the 13th parallel. The sun is out there. But the sun, of course, cannot um, be, be, be the base for the simple reason clouds do come and nights are there. So you still have to have something to hold the base. That's why we're going for geothermal. Because if you install whatever your installation in capacity in solar, you will get maximum around 20%. So if you, if, you, if you install a megawatt of solar, you're talking about the delivery of one-fifth of that megawatt. But if you install a megawatt of, of geothermal, you're getting almost 100% um, base load from that. The foreign exchange to be saved, and we expect the geothermal, the price for geothermal um, to the consumer would be certainly 20% or thereabouts less, hopefully more, um, a larger number less, between 20% and one third. Um, which would make a significant difference to your competitiveness. And then all the training we are doing and in information technology, and then I say the airport, the port, the efficiencies at the port. All these are important bottlenecks which you need to break um, in order to make the kind of jump. And then in relation to the, to, the, to, the, to the regional economy, we have to take advantage of the OECS trading arrangements, CARICOM trading arrangements, and so on and so forth. It has been a very challenging period since 2008. But if you have a framework and you know where you're going, all the challenges, they're seen as limitations for which you have answers with your possibilities to simply move to overcome those limitations. And that's why we have been surviving and thriving. I mean, in the midst of the, 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 the most serious um, recession that the world has seen, depression really, for a hundred years, from 2008 and continuing, we have held things together. We haven't laid off people in the public service. In fact, we have, we have taken on people. We have continued to provide the increments, the normal increments for, for public servants, and about 50-odd percent of them get increments because others are at the top of their scale and don't get increments. And inflation has been kept low. In 2013, inflation was basically flat, zero, and just slightly above zero in 2014. Um, and if you look between 2001 and now, in the public service, 
salaries have increased ranging between 55% and 106% the, through the various categories. I mean, it's a, it's a big story. And even in that period of time, we have had the disasters, the cumulative disasters which we have had between 10, 2010 and now, 2014, among the 600 million Eastern Caribbean dollars, the damage and loss, the one in 2013 was over $330 million Eastern Caribbean. And $600 million Eastern Caribbean is more than one third of our gross domestic product. And we, had, we are taking those things, our strides, and we are recovering. And we have been recovering because we have been very resilient, very careful, very prudent, and at the same time, very enterprising. And we have used our foreign policy to, to, to get a significant amount of resources. And through attracting foreign investment, we have had significant foreign investment. Um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as a percentage of GDP, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has attracted more investment, foreign direct investment, than any country in the Caribbean and Latin America. And obviously not absolutely, that's why I say proportionate to your, our gross domestic product. And in, the abs in absolute terms, in the OECS, um, I think it's only St. Kitts we have been be behind since the, the global crisis. And I think one of the issues in St. Kitts there is there you can the 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 um, the the sale of economic citizenship. So we have been holding ourselves together and moving forward despite the the the, the real challenges, and we we are not out of the woods. But if you have a framework, as I've been suggesting. You, you, can, you can move forward and you keep people informed. And people are more informed in St. Vincent and the Grandines today about what government is doing on economic and social issues than ever before. I'm not talking about because of the explosion of information technology and social media, because much of that is not as informed as they should be, and some of it is quite jaundiced politically, and therefore just involved in pulling down, pulling down. Before we get into the development agenda, I uh, just want to segue a bit and revert to the whole issue of geothermal. Uh, Rekovic and Imera uh, arrived on the 16th, uh, concluded their visit yesterday, visited uh, several areas. Uh, they will report back to the government and the government in May will then say where do we go yes. from here. Um, how has that vis how, how did that visit go? The visit went quite well. Um, they, they came and reported to cabinet. They were to come to me but I had them present to the whole cabinet. We have an excellent geothermal source. The resource is good and rather than doing small bore testing you're going to do essentially a testing which could lead you to production. Um, the business plan would be devised sometime by the end of March, beginning of April, the business model. And by the end of May, early June, we will give our responses to that. But the timetable is that by 2018, we should have um, 10 megawatts of geothermal power. We have 5 megawatts of of um, hydro, and we're fixing up salt rivers. You see that's ha taking place right now. We're fixing up very much, refurbishing down at Richmond, and we have done work since the disaster at Cumberland, improving the efficiencies. We have in the country about 800 um, kilowatt install capacity of solar, and more of that would expand. When you take into account that we have a current demand, peak demand about 20 megawatts, if you get 10 in the first phase of geothermal, we have five in hydro, we have some solar, and then 
it's easy to add another 5 megawatts of um, geothermal. You'll see that what the leadership of Ralph Gonzales is bequeathing to the young people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a green economy. We are on that way to a green economy and cheaper energy and to make it more competitive, to stay within the, with the to build a modern, competitive, many-sided post-colonial economy, which I'm talking about, without the kinds of preferential arrangements, which are gone. Because nobody is going to give us, the, the, there's no gift anymore. And in that context, the Petrocarib Agreement, where we, have, where we are dealing with, with, with fuel for, for electricity, certainly at low months, and, and also at Cane Hall, there would not be the same demand, the same need for that energy for electricity. Petrocarib can then begin to supply to the distributors for the purposes of um, gasoline for trucks and cars and buses and so on and so forth. In part two of the interview, which will be aired in a subsequent program, Prime Minister Gonzales will share some of his deepest thoughts and will give a sneak peek into who has been most influential in his life. You won't want to miss it. And on this note, we conclude our Inside Story program this evening. I leave you with a quote from former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, an excerpt from the speech, Citizenship in a Republic or Man in the Arena, delivered at Sorbonne in Paris, France, on April 23, 1910, and I quote, It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without erring and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat." End of quote. Continue to dare greatly, be safe and have a productive weekend. I am Kesha Woodley.